Live from Maryland Public Television, this is Direct Connection with Jeff Salkin. It is not just for kids anymore. More adults are being diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. Joining us in the studio is Dr. David Goodman, assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and director of the Adult Attention Deficit Disorder Center. Thanks so much for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. When I first heard about this, I thought it was it sounded faddish, to be honest, but you guys have been around for a decade or more. It's very interesting because when you say do you have difficulty finishing things or organizing things or do you get distracted, every adult probably says, oh yeah, I, I have that experience as well. We're talking about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which starts in childhood with inattention, distractibility, and impulsivity, and those symptoms continue in up to 65% of those children into adulthood. We didn't know this before. Pediatricians presume that ADHD stopped in childhood and adolescence. They didn't know it continued into adulthood until we followed these children out 10, 15, and 20 years. So there's no adult onset version of this? Correct. There is no adult onset version of this. Now, you may be newly diagnosed as an adult. If you were bright enough to get through school, were able to compensate for your inattention, then you probably don't get diagnosed until later in life. The children who get diagnosed are the children who are hyperactive and disruptive because it's the disruptive behavior that brings them to the attention of their teachers. And, and that's, that's sort of controversial, and I, I don't want to spend our time too much on that. Um, you know, what, what's the difference between um, ADD and ADHD? The formal title is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and it gets broken up into subsets. A lot of the hyperactivity diminishes as we age, and so adults are called ADD because they don't we, have the hyperactivity. We mellow out. That's well, our brains changes. That that's true. All right. Somebody, somebody who is suffering from this as an adult. How do you know? What are the symptoms? Well, they have difficulty focusing, staying on task. They make careless errors. They have difficulty um, organizing, so it takes them longer to get things done. They're chronically late. They may be impulsive and overspend. This causes a tremendous problem in employment. They're more likely to lose jobs. They're more likely to be divorced. Untreated, they're distractible when they drive, so they're more likely to be involved in car accidents. I mean, what's going on in that person's mind? Because everybody... Almost everybody procrastinates about something or to some degree has some of these behaviors. True. That's not what we're talking about. That's normal fluctuation. We're talking about a set of symptoms that exist all day long, every single day, for as long as I can remember. It's like having blurred vision until you're 30 years old. You learn to compensate, but now I give you a set of glasses and you realize how much clearer you can see. The medications and the treatments that we use alter brain chemistry, normalize it to the sense that you can now focus and stay on a task and read something for a period of time and be able to recall it. You know people in the environment because you'll see people who are kind of fidgety, they're a little distractible, they don't get the answers right, it takes them an ordinate period of time, and people now are sitting, gosh, I, I really do know somebody, and this is highly genetic. It, 80 percent of the cause is genetic. So if your child just got diagnosed and you turn to your husband and say, I knew it, there's good reason because there's a 40 percent chance that a parent has it if the child gets diagnosed. When is it necessary to treat this? And, and is treatment strictly meds or is there any other sort of therapy that works? Well, it's important to get an evaluation to get accurately diagnosed. At that point, if in fact you have this condition, then the treatment encompasses medication, education, learning about what this is and what it's not, organizational techniques, and some psychotherapy in a family setting because a non-ADHD spouse can be exhausted by the ADHD spouse who can't oversee the homework with the kids and can't go to the grocery store and get all of the groceries on the list. So what goes on in, in that family therapy um, are are the, the other people in the room just spectators? How do you involve them? Well, what we do is we include the ADHD adult and the spouse. 
and we tell the spouse, look, this guy's got a condition. Let's assume it's the father. This guy's got a condition. He's not doing it to bother you. He's not doing it to annoy you. He just can't keep track of things. So we help organize the house in a way that the ADHD person gets the information and the non-ADHD person doesn't get exhausted by saying the same thing over and over and over again to somebody who can't remember. I, I know there's people watching who are thinking, this could be the excuse I've been looking for for why I didn't get all the groceries. Right. Do you get that sometimes? Do people think of this as not fully legitimate? Right. Get it all the time. Um, and because the symptoms sound so common, they sound like experiences we all have. What you need to understand is that these experiences occur every single day for your entire life, leading to impairments in your work, your occupation, your employment. Um, this is more severe. Not everybody in this country has this condition. It's 4% of the adult population translates into 10 million. In contrast to children, where 60% of the children have been identified and treated in the past year, only 15% of adults have been treated for this condition. We have people walking around with this condition. They don't even know why they can't get things done. Let's grab a phone call. Kevin, Kent County. Kevin, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Yeah, you were saying about... Um you know, people don't show up to work on time and and not responsible for showing up to their jobs and stuff like that. I've had ADHD since I was a child. I'm 46 years old now, and I'm the first guy to work every day. I I have to concentrate to do what I'm doing, but it's 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 not as uncontrollable as what you think. I I take a drug called Wellbutrin that really helps bring your focus into it. It, to the center more. Kevin, that's great. Glad it's gone well for you. Let's, let's talk about the medications a little bit. Um, the stuff I had heard of was in the stimulant category. Mm -hmm. Wellbutrin is like a Prozac class, right? Well, Wellbutrin is different than Prozac, but it's, a, and it's an antidepressant. It never got approval for ADHD in any age group, but it was shown to be effective, and sometimes it's useful in people who have depression and ADHD. The common drugs, the first-line drugs that we use for ADHD are the stimulants. They come in a variety of preparations, and it's counterintuitive because you say stimulants, it must rev me up. Actually, the ADHD brain is wired differently than the common brain, and so stimulant class of medications tend to calm people down and increase their ability to focus. The medications that we use now are once-a-day stimulants that will last throughout the day. Donna, Baltimore County. Donna, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Hi. I'm currently on uh, Cymbalta for uh, ADHD, but the problem I am finding is that the anxiety is what I can't control. I can get uh, organized fairly well, but if if I don't control that anxiety, I can't get through the day. Donna, thanks very much. How often do you see it with other conditions at the same time? It's actually very common. Actually, 70% of adults with ADHD have another psychiatric condition, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, anxiety, depression. And so often you'll have patients who are not only on a once-a-day stimulant for their ADHD, but they may be on another medication to improve the symptoms of anxiety and depression. Who, who do you see for this? If, if somebody's watching and they, you know, they recognize some stuff and they want to talk to somebody, um, can your family practitioner deal with this or you need a specialist? Well, family practice physicians and primary care physicians are coming up to speed, but you know nobody's been trained in the residency about this. The research has just exploded in the last 10 years, and so I travel around the country trying to educate physicians as to how to identify this in patients. Now, you can go to your primary care physician, but if they're not experienced or they don't know much about this, then seek out a specialist in your area. And, and the good news, before I'm totally out of time, is that once it's recognized and treated, you can live a pretty nor normal life. Once it's recognized and treated, the, the world opens up. People blossom. They go back to school. They finish college. They don't get fired. They pass their uh, securities exchange exams. It, it's really remarkable. I have one guy, double his income in three years. Good deal. Dr. David Goodman of Johns Hopkins, very much appreciate your being with us. You're welcome. Thanks again, and thank you for watching Direct Connection, and have a good night.